Now, on the internet, or rather, when on the internet, I guess one of the more popular items that is, or rather, more popular features, more popular features of the internet will be the World Wide Web, right? And over on the World Wide Web, a lot of people does business. When or if people does business, um, it's a good thing to take care of your customers. For example, uh, know what their preferences are and etc. Right? Or rather, at the very least, you would want to know how many customers actually come to your website. Why would you want to do that? Because basically, <coughs> when or if you have a website, you're actually paying for bandwidth, meaning you're actually paying for the assumed number of customers that can actually come to your shop, something like that. Right? But in the case of a website, basically you have uh, a certain amount of traffic, so you deal with that with your service provider. Let's say your service provider says, okay, I can provide you like some kind of a pathway where uh, 100,000 people can come to your website in a month. And for that, you have to pay me this amount of money. Right? And generally speaking, for websites that can have more visitors coming in, um, in a matter of time, right? you will have to pay more for that, for that service, right? So you want to know exactly how much, what is the estimate of number of people coming to your website. So it's a very good idea to actually keep track of these things, keep track of cons consumers or customers coming to your website or to your store, right? And to be able to do that, websites make use of this thing called a cookie. A cookie is a small file written to your hard disk and it is written by the website that you visit. Now, the idea behind it is of course something good, uh, which is to keep track of consumers, which is to keep track of customers, people coming to our, our site so we can treat them better next time or something like that, provide better service, right? But of course, it can be abused, right? <coughs> For example, if say, uh, the cookie comes from your website, it's okay. Generally speaking, um, your site Generally speaking, it's a good cookie, right? It's a native cookie, meaning it is only active inside your website. Once you go to other websites, this cookie becomes inactive. It will not take data, right? Inside your website, this cookie will actually keep track of things. Let's say, for example, what are your preferences? What region or country are you from? What time did you visit? And etc. By keeping track of these things, the website can then provide better service next time. For example, let's say, visitors from Asia always go to certain parts of the website, right? So next time, maybe when there's, for example, festivities in Asia, Chinese New Year, Hari Raya, whatever, they can do some kind of special things in these parts of the website, right? Uh, so this is, it's a rather good idea to actually keep track of your visitors. But that said, there are actually bad, bad people who actually put cookies as well. They actually give cookies when people visit other people's website, right? Meaning instead of uh, the cookie coming from your site, someone else actually creates a cookie and actually give it to visitors to your site. Now, this is a malicious cookie. This is a bad cookie. This is an active cookie. Meaning it will actually follow the visitor around and keep track of whatever the visitor is doing, right? So this is otherwise a somewhat a, a, a kind of spyware, meaning it spies on you. It keeps track of your behavior. Imagine that. Imagine you're going to shops one by one and people are actually following you around or stalking, you know, keeping track of what you're doing uh, at that particular time, what shop you went in. This is not very comfortable, right? So this is <coughs> what Active Cookie can do. It actually keeps track of what you do, right? So this is collection of information without consent. And when the cookie does that, basically what happens is that it is eroding your privacy, meaning to say that now you don't have privacy, you don't have control over your own personal data because technology can actually take your personal data and maybe use it later. How does it use it? Right? That is this thing called adware. Right? And adware, um, you can also call it an ad serving cookie. Right? Um, there are various kinds of adware, it's a generic term. right? And one of the uh, elements of adware is an ad serving cookie. Basically, what this cookie does is it keeps track of what you do online. So it can pretty much guess what your interests are. Then it will update a server. Then the server will determine what your interests can be, can potentially be. 
So the next websites you visit, there will be advertisements, banners, and etc., which is targeted to your supposed interests. This is not comfortable. People are collecting information about you and guessing what you can be interested in. A lot of websites actually do this. Um, for example, Facebook, they keep track of your um, supposed close friends, and so in your timeline, you only have your close friends. But anyhow, so a cookie is one such technology can, that can erode privacy. There are actually three others that we can discuss in this particular chapter, right? The three other, <coughs> aside from cookie, the three other technologies that can erode privacy would be RFID, sorry, radio frequency identification, right? Global unique identifier, global unique identifier, radio frequency identification, and ubiquitous computing. I'm a bit nervous because I'm not entirely sure when the battery of this camera will run out. So please wait a bit. Okay. I think we should have time for all of these uh, technologies, all four technologies that can erode privacy online. Let's talk about radio frequency identification. Uh, sorry. Let's talk about global unique identifier. What is that? When you purchase hardware or software, <coughs> they're actually a unique identification, meaning to say that each software copies being sold or each hardware being sold actually has a unique identification number right and these identification numbers enable the hardware or software to communicate with the server the server which is created of course by the makers of the software again the idea behind this technology global unique identification is to provide you better service right for example let's say uh, we are all using Microsoft Word Right? and they detect that you're a user from Asia and they detect that um, instead of using the regular version of Word or, or other users from Asia always use a lot of clip arts for example if they know that the next time they are going to ship their software to Asia right? Microsoft for example going to ship Word and Excel and PowerPoint to Asia they can then have more uh, clip arts right? If, say, you use a lot of clip arts, for example, and you're from Asia, they can keep track of that by way of GUID. Although this is a very, uh, a fairly good idea, meaning to say that, again, it's on the premise of we want to keep, we want to take care of you, we want to provide better service for you. But if you have no control over this, then, again, that is defined as collection of information, collection of information without consent, meaning people are actually taking information from you, for example, your behavior and interest, and using that somewhat without you having a say of whether or not they should be doing that, right? So this is again an invasion of privacy. It's called global unique identification. Next is radio frequency identification. <coughs> again, um, here is radio frequency, meaning to say that it's some kind of a chip or some kind of a mechanism or some kind of a generally it's a chip, right? They can they can actually have some kind of radio frequency, meaning it can actually communicate with other radio frequency able devices. Or rather, if you have a detector for that kind of radio frequency, you'll be able to detect it. And sometimes these RFID chips can actually have information on you, information on lots of other things, right? You can actually use an RFID chip for inventory, meaning you can actually slap it on a on a product and the RFID chip will uh, be used as some kind of a security device. If you take it outside of the store, there will be some kind of beeping sound. Or um, if you legally take it out of the store, meaning to say that you, you purchase it, then the store can update its inventory. Right? It can also be used in other means. It can be put in pets and keep track of where they go. For example, pets like, um, was it Arwana? Ar the, the king-like fish, you know, the emperor-like fish, uh, which is very expensive. I think those fish actually have chips installed in, in them, right? Race horses have chips installed in them to keep track of the bloodline of the race horses, right? So RFID chip is used for inventory, it's used for tagging, it's even used for our passports. It actually has RFID chip. Because of that, we can go through the auto gate, right? Of course, convenience, of course, keeping track of things is good, right? We keep track of things, but what if people actually misuse the chip in our passport 
imagine you know there's a lot of information inside the chip for example uh, blood type uh, height and eye eye color hair color um, IC number a lot of other things which can be misused right so again it has the potential to be abused and it has the potential to erode your privacy because in a way you have no control over what it does what information it collects from you right the last one is of course ubiquitous computing this is where uh, you communicate with a lot of networkable computers and um, usually by way of not actively logging in for example let's say you log on to Facebook on your mobile devices you rarely log out right so here what happens is that your mobile devices is connected to the Facebook server along with other different services uh, services and servers online which you may or may not be aware of right so here your device is an active some somewhat an active batch meaning to say that you have no control over let's say for example people can pick up your phone right and you have no one of those screen locks you don't have that for example and people are able to go to your Facebook needlessly they can hack your Facebook and write stupid things like uh, my armpits are smelly or something like that or I haven't bathed for three days or something like that which is not fun but fun is not the only thing here what is also counted is your personal belongings which is your information what if people can actually take your personal information and that is highly doable with ubiquitous computing where you communicate with multiple networkable devices right um, as well uh, you might have noticed lecturers have this tag with they use which they use to to come into the lectures room right so I would like to think that the those tags are not very smart tags meaning to say that they just allow access but there are companies which have smart tags where inside the tag there's actually information about IC number and all of these different employee number whatever right blood type and whatnot right which can again be used to communicate with multiple networkable computers and which can also be abused in the sense that it can actually collect your personal information without consent right so these are the four technologies uh, one is given by a website one is on a piece of hardware or software and it communicates with the server whether or not uh, you are aware of it, right? One is uh, you can say an active chip, right? A, a chip that is used to control inventory, and another is the use of computers in a networkable environment, right? And so all of these can actually erode privacy because they have the potential to be abused, and because they can actually collect information uh, with or without your consent, and or with or without you knowing that information is being collected. Right? So this is not fun.